Welcome to episode three of Nation Rising. This morning we're filming at the historic Kendall Tavern here in Lemister, built in 1785 by Jonas Kendall. That was two years after the Peace of Paris and two years before the U.S. Constitution was written. Kendall was an important early Lemister leader, held a lot of different positions, including town positions. He was a state senator. He was a member of the 16th U.S. Congress from 1819 to 1821, and he was deeply involved in the local business community, having owned a paper mill, a flaxseed oil mill, and having run this tavern behind me for more than a generation. This tavern was at a critical location at the junction of the Union Turnpike and the 5th Massachusetts Turnpike. They say that from the third floor attic window, you could see dust being kicked up by horses coming from the east on the Union Turnpike out west here to Lumister. It was also, as I indicated, the beginning of the 5th Mass Turnpike, which went from here, a private toll road, all the way out to Northfield, Massachusetts. And in fact, Jonas Kendall, was a proprietor or director of that private corporation. I hope you enjoy this latest episode in which you will learn about Lemister's response to troubles with Great Britain and the war for independence, the American Revolution. Thanks for joining us. Trouble on the North American continent with the French and their Native American allies was not only a military threat, but also an economic drain on the British Empire. Before long, the citizens of Lemonster, like their counterparts in other parts of the colonies, would be faced with the harsh realities of just how the financial drain would be dealt with. The British plan to fund the cost of the colony's defense was enacted by Parliament in 1765. The legislation required the colonists to pay a tax, represented by a stamp, on a number of paper items ranging from legal documents to playing cards and diplomas. The colonists were outraged. It didn't matter that similar taxes at higher rates were paid by the citizens of the mother country for years. The colonial protests prompted a new rallying cry, no taxation without representation. The movement was not completely consistent as the colonies had long accepted taxes levied by Parliament against small farms, religious dissenters, and backcountry pioneers. What the colonists really wanted was no taxation at all. The dissent resulted in the creation of a Stamp Act Congress in which 27 delegates from nine colonies gathered in New York to organize their displeasure with the law. The enforcement of agreements for the non-importation of British goods by radical groups, including the Sons of Liberty, caused violence to erupt throughout the colonies, which involved the tarring and feathering of stamp agents and violators of the non-importation agreements. In Massachusetts, the royal governor's home was ransacked and destroyed. Lemonster stood with Boston in opposition to the detestable Stamp Act. At a town meeting held on March 3, 1766, the assembled voted to send Boston a letter of support. To the town of Boston. An address from the town of Leminster, voted at their annual meeting, March 3, 1766. Gentlemen, we have with much pleasure observed how nobly you have exerted yourselves as advocates of liberty, and defenders of the natural rights of men especially, of British Americans. We take this opportunity to present you, hoping you will candidly accept, our sincere united thanks for the great good you have designed and done in standing first for the liberty wherewith the author of nature and of the Christian religion, hath made us free. For we esteem you, under God, the great protector of our freedom, civil, and religious, the latter of which, we are persuaded, cannot long survive the former, we have an ambition to be enrolled among the true sons of liberty. Therefore, on this occasion, we declare our earnest detestation of the Stamp Act, as an engine of wickedness and cruelty, 
calculated to destroy the British Constitution as well as the sacred privileges of His Majesty's free and loyal subjects in America, as we retain our perfect loyalty to the best of kings, we must abhor the villainy and folly of the men who have presumed to give the worst advice. Two years later, the town sent a committee of three to Boston to meet with others on the dangerous situation of the country. In November of 1772, the town of Boston published a political pamphlet outlining the constitutional rights enjoyed by Massachusetts citizens and the efforts by the royal government to infringe those rights. The pamphlet was distributed to 260 Massachusetts towns with a request that each hold proceedings and formulate a response. Seventy of the towns did in fact respond to the Boston pamphlet and Leminster was one of them. At a meeting held on January 25, 1773, the freeholders of the town of Leominster met and discussed the Boston pamphlet. The meeting approved nine resolutions fully supporting the cause outlined in the Boston pamphlet. The eighth resolution provided, voted, that we will at all times unite with our brethren by all lawful, reasonable, and constitutional methods to recover and preserve our rights and privileges. The colonial crisis continued without any real improvement, and by August 22, 1774, Leminster chose a committee of correspondence. The Leminster Committee fully cooperated in the colonial communications supporting the First Continental Congress. The committee consisted of Thomas Leggett, Israel Nichols, Stephen Johnson, John Joslin Jr., and Dr. Thomas Gowing. Five days after the Leminster Committee was chosen, the members met to discuss possible resolutions. The consensus of the committee was to wait for Congress to recommend specific measures before issuing many of their own resolves. They did, however, issue four recommendations, including a strong admonition to the town to assist, quote, the industrious poor of the town of Boston who are really exposed to the most severe hardships by means of the late cruel acts of Parliament. The final paragraph of the directive read as follows. Fourth, we recommend peace, firmness, and a manly fortitude in asserting and maintaining to the utmost of our abilities all of our just, lawful, and constitutional rights and privileges. Thomas Leggett, Israel Nichols, Stephen Johnson, John Joslin Jr., Thomas Gowling. Committee, August 27th, 1774. In 1774, Nathaniel Chapman volunteered for Colonel Whitcomb's 23rd Regiment. He was the father of John Chapman, also known as Johnny Appleseed, who was born in Leominster on September 26, 1774. While no one is sure Johnny Appleseed was born in the moon of apple blossoms, his maternal ancestors, James Simon, arrived in America on board a ship named the Planter, and his paternal ancestor died in leaving his estate ten good fruit-bearing trees near the end of his house. The birth of Johnny Appleseed was not the only local event to impact Leminster in 1774, despite all that was happening beyond the town's borders. The center of Leminster was moved about 1,000 feet south from the old burial ground to what we know today as the town common. Up until 1774, the center of Leminster was in front of Pine Grove Cemetery, which of course is about a solid three quarters of a mile north of here. By 1773, the citizens of the community had agitated for a new meeting house, and on May 3rd of that year, there was finally a vote to construct it. Construction on this meeting house started in 1774. As I indicated, it's built on the site of this monument. It was 60 feet long, 50 feet wide. It fronted on the square, and its pulpit was to the rear of where I'm standing right now. 
On the main floor, there were 18 pews in the center, 30 pews around it. It had a gable end with a porch on each side so you could access the second floor. And on the second floor, there were another 23 pews that could hold people as well as pews in the corner for what they referred to back in those days as the colored people. Uh, this was the center of Lemister government as well as its church because there was no separation of church and state back in these days. And it served the citizens of Lemister from 1774 all the way till 1824 when church and state were finally separated in Lemister. And then affairs of the state, the town, were not conducted with the godly worship on Sundays in the meeting house. The significance of other Lemonster occurrences in 1774 were not as readily apparent. In the autumn of that year, Smith Hills and his family moved from West Newbury, Massachusetts to Lemonster. With them came comb-making experience. The following year, Smith's sons, Obadiah and Silas, began manufacturing combs from horn in their kitchen. This beautiful colonial behind me was built in 1759 by Elias Carter, one of Nathaniel Carter's four sons. It's a great home, and more importantly for our local history, by 1773 it was purchased by someone named Smith Hills. Smith Hills came here with 17 children from Newburyport, and Newburyport was a center, an early center, of the comb industry in our nation. By 1774, the following year, two of Smith Hill's sons, Obadiah and Silas, began making combs in their father's kitchen. And thus was born Lemister's comb industry. By 1798, Obadiah had gone back to Newburyport, but Silas had carried on the trade and built a home for himself just up the street where he continued the manufacture of combs. By 1800, the local newspaper at the time, the Telescope, reported on the comb production of the local, local industry. On May 20th of that year, th there were 24 Lemister inhabitants involved in the production of combs. On that particular day, they manufactured 991 combs. This, of course, is the birth of the comb industry in Lemister. Now, in those days, combs were manufactured from tortoise shell and from horn. Not until later on in the 19th century did we start to introduce early plastic compounds, which Lemister was a forerunner of. So it's very fitting to say that the plastic industry was really born in some ways directly or indirectly here, right at this homestead, way back in 1774, giving Lemister forever the name, the comb city, or the plastic capital of the world. But before Lemonster could take its part in the Industrial Revolution, there was a nation to build. The series of events we call the American Revolution was a miraculous convergence of many circumstances. The fact that 13 separate colonies, each possessing its own distinct legislature, economy, people and way of life could come together, convene a Congress, and declare independence from a world power was clearly remarkable. As Benjamin Franklin noted, nobody sober or drunk believed in 1774 that the colonies would either be at war with Great Britain or declare their independence. All of the events leading up to that declaration had to unfold in a precise pattern with each nuance and intricacy fitting sharply into place. That which distinguished each colony from another, and there were differences aplenty, had to be set aside to produce a vote for independence. Massachusetts, the hotbed of revolutionary zeal, sent representatives with sharp political skills to the Continental Congress. While John Adams could finally maneuver a parliamentary resolution, his cousin Sam Adams was no less skillful in what his contemporaries called 
out-of-door politics. Both keenly recognized the need to appeal to and incorporate Virginia delegation to Congress in their plans. Virginia was a large, wealthy, and important colony, indispensable to the cause. Virginia sent delegations to Philadelphia that were aristocratic and bearing, having title in common with counterparts from New England. Nonetheless, John Adams and Sam Adams spearheaded the effort to select Virginian George Washington as the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army and the 31-year-old Thomas Jefferson as the principal drafter of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson's selection, while largely the result of his status as a Virginian, was also called on his authority an uncompromising pamphlet entitled A Summary View of the Rights of British America in 1774. What most United Colonists, and more importantly their distinct colonies, was the essential view that each colony, being inhabited by free British subjects, had the right to govern itself. The revolution was not calculated to separate from the British Empire so much as it was to protect the principles of self-governance. Those principles were rooted not only in the tradition of more than 100 years of self-government, but also in the commentary of many thinkers on both sides of the Atlantic. On April 19th of 1775, a critical date, of course, which was the hostilities at Lexington and Concord, Lemister had, uh, at that time, a sawmill in the middle of town and a mill pond that went along with it, owned by Joshua White. And legend has it, on that fateful day, a young man was out in the mill pond uh, entertaining two young women, sisters, named Willock. And when the alarm guns went off, signaling the uh, hostilities at Lexington and Concord, it surprised them enough uh, that they drifted towards the dam of the mill pond and turned the boat just in time, but unfortunately also capsized and into the drink all three of them went. And there was a famous poem back at the time that was drafted by someone that went like this. But White being strong and meeting no harm, he took a Miss Wheelock under each arm and carried them both safely ashore, then bid them goodbye and said nothing more. But hastening home, he snatched his gun and traveled off for Lexington. The bloodshed at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill commenced an eight year conflict. It pitted British regulars against an army they could neither contain nor defeat. Washington was unable to deal the British any sort of decisive blow until French naval assistance helped bottle up Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown. Exhausted and frustrated by what became an expanded war with the French, the British finally entered into a treaty in 1783 recognizing the free and independent states of America. It's interesting that the Kendall Tavern today is flying a Benetton battle flag. And why that's interesting is the former owner, about 10 years ago, put up a flag of that nature without really even knowing the significance it had to the tavern. Well, it turns out that the original occupant and builder of the Kendall Tavern, Jonas Kendall, answered the call for the Battle of Bennington. He was one of the militiamen that marched out there to defend New England when the British attacked Bennington. Why were the British in Bennington? Well, you may remember that uh, General Burgoyne, the British general, had a strategy that involved separating New England from the rest of the colonies. They were gonna march south from Canada and they were going to cut New England off. The, the radical of hotbeds, the New Englands, is they were gonna cut them off from the rest of the colonies. Well, during that long battle, 
Colonel Bourgoin or General Bourgoin sent a detachment of Hessians, trained military people that were paid for by the British, to Bennington for fresh horses and supplies. And when that happened, of course, it was an actual incursion into New England. And many people from this area, including Jonas Kendall, went out to answer that call. Another person from Lemister that went out to answer the call was Captain Joslin. And that unfortunately ended with some tragedy. Suddenly, the enemy's fire was received as lead projectiles pierced the summer air. Thomas Joslin, who was the youngest brother of the captain, was hit. The ball pierced his heart. Thomas fell and uttered his last words. I am a dead man. The Lord have mercy on my soul. Other, more fortunate Lemister soldiers were speedily returned to their home and families to recount the sight of the conquered Hessian and British soldiers laying their arms down and being marched out as prisoners of war. Beyond the ultimate sacrifice of blood and life, Lemonster inhabitants faithfully supplied the money for its enlistments and certain provisions. But by November of 1777, the town became concerned about the increasing burdens put upon it for men and money, when other towns did not meet their quotas. At a meeting held June 3, 1778, the town voted to send a remonstrance to the general court, warning that the failure of other towns to meet their enlistment quotas may soon prevent Lemonster from continuing to satisfy increased burdens resulting therefrom, without being reduced to the greatest extremity. It is not known if the remonstrance had any effect. The town was not given a new quota for soldiers until early in 1781. The reprieve in supplying enlistments did not abate the call for provisions. In September of 1780, the Massachusetts House of Representatives required the towns of the Commonwealth to furnish 2,400,400 pounds of beef, or the monetary equivalent for the army. Lemonster surpassed its quota of 7,200 pounds by 334 pounds. When new enlistments were required in 1781, the town was divided into sections, each required to provide and pay for one man. One of those enlistments, David Jocelyn, was almost 16 years old. In order to pass muster, he had to wear a thick-heeled shoe and extra undergarments. Despite his tender age and diminutive stature, it was recorded that Jocelyn made an excellent soldier. He survived the war, returned to Lemonster, and received 18 young cattle in fulfillment of the agreement he signed with the section of Lemonster that sponsored his enlistment. Appended to his contract with the class section of town was a lock of his hair for his friends to remember him should he not return. Lemonster, April 10th, 1781. I, the subscriber, do engage to serve in the Continental Army for three years unless sooner discharged. For the class of which Captain Joshua Wood is the head, provided the class pay me $2,000 in paper money or silver at the exchange before I go, and 18 three-year-old middling cattle, provided I stay two years and six months. And if I stay one year and six months, said cattle are to be two years old. And if I stay not one week, said cattle are to be one year old. David Johnson. Lancaster, April 12, 1781. Then passed muster, David Joe's Lynn for a continental soldier for the term of three years, and for the town of Lemster, and Captain Joshua Wood's class. Before me, William Dunsmoor. Winning peace and independence was only part of the journey. It did not guarantee the formation of a government 
that would successfully unite the newly independent states. Many states and their citizens jealously guarded their autonomy and the principle of self-governance, which was the motivating force for the revolution in the first place. In an atmosphere of distrust of each other, in any strong central government too resemblant of the one most recently dispensed with, the new nation attempted government under a loosely arranged system called the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles, each sovereign state had an equal voice and vote. The trouble was, the accomplishment of any important business required the affirmative vote of nine of the 13 states. As a result, the central government, to the extent it existed at all, lacked any real authority, including the power to raise armies, conduct foreign affairs, regulate trade, coin money, or establish a judicial system. Lemonster survived these years of economic turmoil quite well. According to Wilder, although the inhabitants of this town sustained themselves in a remarkable degree in the trials through which they had passed, yet it was far otherwise in many other towns, and especially in the county of Worcester, in what was then the county of Hampshire. In the years 1784 and 1785, over 4,000 legal claims were brought in the Worcester County Court for the collection of debts at a time when the total population of the county numbered less than 50,000. Many farmers suffered under a crushing burden of the taxes, private debt, court costs, and legal fees. Winning the war was one thing, but creating a nation was another. And Lemister was in the middle of that as well. It seems that by 1786, before the Constitution was written and we were operating our national government under the weak Articles of Confederation, our economy was in shambles. Farmers were having a difficult time paying their debts and creditors were demanding hard specie, gold and silver, in the payment of debts. No longer would they accept barter or paper money, which was virtually worthless. This led to a lot of problems. Farms were being foreclosed in record numbers and people were starting to rebel. Farmers actually turned out to close down courthouses in a variety of places, including Worcester County. Turns out that the people from Lemister were really not behind Shea's rebellion. They were pretty conservative by nature. And it turns out that they sent people to put Shea's rebellion down. It's interesting that Patriot Samuel Adams even advocated that the rebellious farmers be executed. And here's the guy that was part of the American Revolution. He drew a distinction between revolting against a monarch and revolting against a democratic government. Be that as it may, um, in 1837, Jonas Kendall gave a speech memorializing the 50th anniversary of the Lemister Artillery Company, formed in 1787, largely in response to Shea's Rebellion. Let's take a little listen to what he had to say about it back in 1837. Suits were commenced by creditors. The debtors had not the means of making remittances Opposition to laws commenced. The courts of Judica were stopped by an armed force under the command of Daniel Shays. The militia were called to arms. Neighbors met each other in deadly combat. Fortunately, but few lives were lost. Honorable for this town, none of its citizens were found in the ranks of the insurgents. The insurrection was suppressed with but little bloodshed. The government of laws again prevailed and harmony among the people was restored. Two who enlisted in the militia from Lemonster were Ensign John Buss and Major Timothy Botell during the height of the rebellion in January 1787. The major was promoted to colonel. Shay's rebellion came to a head on January 25, 1787, when the rebel forces attacked 
the Federal Armory at Springfield. The armory was defended by Militia General William Shepard, who ordered grape shot be fired from two cannons at the insurgents. The volley killed either three or four. This point is debated. The rebel advance was stopped and they fled north to Amherst. General Lincoln led his forces west from Worcester and chased the rebels to Pelham and Petersham until they eventually dispersed to Vermont and New Hampshire. When the insurgents were at Petersham, Colonel Boutel is credited with leading an advance guard on their encampment. On a bitterly cold night, they surprised the rebels in their beds, obtaining their surrender without firing a shot. The lasting impact of Shays' rebellion was the inescapable conclusion that a weak central government, a consequence of the Articles of Confederation, could no longer serve the national interest. The rebellion convinced the country's leaders most notably George Washington, to lend their credibility to an extrajudicial convention, a constitutional convention aimed at creating a new, more powerful central government to serve the country. Delegates sent to state ratifying conventions in their state capitals had to balance between the need for a central government with enough strength to survive and the rights of individual states. Wilder described the issue. The next trial through which the inhabitants of this town were called to pass was of a political character. It was no less than to form a constitution or enact a supreme law by which all the states and all the people in the several states should be governed. It was no easy matter to frame an instrument that would confer a sufficient degree of power on a United States government, and at the same time not deprive individual states of a portion of their constitutional rights and privileges. But a constitution was framed and sent out to the several states for their action upon it. The convention assembled at Boston in February of 1788 to determine whether Massachusetts would vote for ratification. The delegates voted in the affirmative, but by a small margin. Anti-Federalist leaders John Hancock and Samuel Adams promoted amendments that would guarantee civil liberties. Consistent with the town's conservatism, respect for authority, and its response to Shays' rebellion, the delegates from Leominster voted positively to adopt the United States Constitution. On July 2, 1788, Congress declared the new Constitution to be in effect after the requisite number of states ratified the new government. At the same time, instructions for the election of the first Congress and President were issued. It was a new beginning for the nation and for the town of Leominster. In that important year, the inhabitants of the town's two precincts reunited under Reverend Gardner, look forward to a new era, a single preacher in one meeting house on the common, in a new invigorated federal government at New York City. Differences were put aside and our young nation rallied behind its unanimous choice of a new president, George Washington. Washington's most enduring legacy might be his ability to unify the new nation in its universal trust for him. Despite the beginning signs of friction during his eight years in office, Washington was able to maintain calm and dispel factionalism. He despised it, he warned against it, and solemnly believed that political parties were not in the nation's best interests. The umbrella of George Washington and the nation's faith in him would not last forever. Washington would bid the nation farewell in a famous speech, establishing the precedent that America's highest office was not one's birthright. The noble Virginian would retire to Mount Vernon in a final gesture of statesmanship. He would have and take 
no part in politics. George Washington died on December 14th, 1799. Lemonster was like towns across the young country and would honor their fallen founding father. Lemonster faced a new century, the first full century of its existence, and another epoch was left behind. It was a time that would never be forgotten. Nothing signaled the passing of an era more poignantly than the death of George Washington. Our first president and commander in chief of the Continental Army died at Mount Vernon, his home, on December 14, 1799. Like the rest of the nation, Lemonster mourned the passing of the father of our country. On February 22nd, 1800, the town turned out in mass. A procession advanced to the meeting house. The cortege included three military companies, the pupils and teachers from all seven schools, and most of Lemister's townspeople. They gathered at the meeting house where Reverend Francis Gardner offered a prayer from a pulpit shrouded in black. Dr. Daniel Adams, a medical doctor and publisher of The Telescope, a newspaper published in Lemister at that time delivered the eulogy. A hymn performed that day was reprinted in the telescope. Its first three stanzas captured the mood of the town and the nation. What solemn sounds the ears invade, what wraps the land in sorrow's shade. From heaven the awful mandate flies, the father of his country dies. Let every heart be filled with woe, let every eye with tears o'erflow. Columbia sons and daughters mourn, with minds oppressed and hearts forlorn. Behold the venerable band, the rulers of our mourning land, with grief proclaim from shore to shore, our guide, our Washington's no more. Lemonster was growing by 1800. The second U.S. Census compiled that year, reported the town's population at 1,486. The new census report represented an increase of 297 persons from the first U.S. Census a decade before. At least a few of the new people were attracted to the town for the natural beauty of Lemonster's gently rolling hills and the open space of the countryside. One of those people had a special interest in the town's services for George Washington. Joel Crosby came to Lemonster in 1790. He was the proprietor of Boston's Lamb Tavern, and the stories heard about the town's bucolic setting brought him to Lemonster. Before his days at the Lamb Tavern, Crosby served as one of General Washington's bodyguards. Crosby bought the property located at the northeast corner of what is now Merriam Ave and Lindell Avenues. At the time of Crosby's purchase, the property was improved by the home of Timothy Kendall. Crosby had the home moved down Lindell Avenue with a process that involved rolling it on logs to its present location at 164 Lindell Avenue. In its place, he built a large, federal-styled home where he lived for many years. A town leader, Crosby held the office of state representative for a number of terms between 1810 and 1829. The former bodyguard to General Washington was not the only Lemonster transplant with a colorful war service. Asa Johnson, the youngest of six children, was born in Bolton, Massachusetts in 1759. During the Revolution, Johnson became part of America's private navy. Licensed by the new government, more than 1,600 vessels prowled the American coast as privateers. 
The regular American Navy numbered less than 70 ships at any given time. Privateers were vital in the harassment of British merchant shipping, capturing more than 1,300 British ships and millions of dollars of supplies and war material and some 15,000 prisoners. Being captured as a privateer had drastic consequences, either impressment in the British Navy or imprisonment, most likely on board a moored ship under the most squalid of conditions. Johnson was in fact captured during his service at sea. In his case, apprehension meant imprisonment at Halifax. After the passage of considerable time, Johnson was liberated, most likely as the result of escape. Somehow, the freed privateer got himself on another vessel, and this time was fortunate enough to participate in the capture of a British ship. As a member of the crew, Johnson was entitled to a percentage of the value of the prize. Once back on land, Johnson used his prize money to fund an education at Harvard University, where he was a classmate of President John Quincy Adams. Johnson graduated in 1787, and as was then the custom, studied the law with a practicing attorney in preparation for his chosen profession. Wilder's quote about the coming of the legal profession in Leominster is amusing. With regard to the legal profession, the town has been highly favored. For nearly the whole of the first half century there was no lawyer here. The first who established himself as an attorney in this place was Asa Johnson. Asa Johnson was Leminster's first lawyer. He probably arrived in Leminster sometime in 1789, based on Wilder's quote. He was a man of many eccentricities something well noted by his contemporaries. He lived and died as a bachelor. His home contained no plates made of earthenware. He refused to eat off them. His guests were often surprised by the fare, since attorney Johnson frequently dined on such oddities as cats, owls, hawks, and various reptiles. Attorney Johnson did father a daughter. What Wilder recounts about this relationship does not have a happy ending. He was the father of a young lady whom he educated with paternal fondness, yet he would never allow her to call him father, it must on all occasions, be Mr. Johnson. Not having married to meet his views, she was partially discarded, but her death, soon after, appeared to affect him, although he resolutely declared that he had not the smallest anxiety for her, after she had disobeyed his injunctions in matrimony. It was recognized that Leminster's first lawyer was skilled in the art of repartee. Wilder recorded an oft-repeated example of Johnson practicing his talent on an unsuspecting young attorney. A young mellow-headed lawyer sitting in company with Johnson, who was surrounded with counselors, thinking to put him to a blush, asked him if he had ever eaten a dish of stewed pollywogs, having been informed that he had a relish for disgusting rarities. Johnson answered in the negative, and said he did not think they would injure him however, if he should. But observed to his interrogator, that it would be a ruinous meal for him. Why? said the lawyer. Because, answered Johnson, it is a well-known fact that pollywogs will kill goslings. Johnson lived as an atheist, but that didn't stop him from going to meetings and singing in a loud, billowing voice to the great dismay of Deacon Nichols. The townspeople trusted him enough to vote him in as the town treasurer for a number of years. It was said that he may have regretted his manners and religious views later in his life. In view of his impending death, he was reported to proclaim, I have been a wicked man. For nearly a decade, Attorney Johnson was Leminster's sole legal counselor. In those days, it was often said that when a town has only one lawyer, he goes in want. But when a town has two lawyers, they both prosper. Thank you for tuning in to episode three of Nation Rising. We look forward to bringing you episode four in the near future. In episode four, 
you'll have a look at how the early Lemister citizens grappled with the politics of the new century. Once 1800 came around and Thomas Jefferson was elected president, a lot changed as Washington predicted politics would enter the national picture, and it certainly did. And there were all sorts of difficulties in those early years between the political parties, one favoring France, the other one favoring England. Who would we trade with? Who would we support? And it drew us into conflict and ultimately grave difficulties in the early years of our republic. Stay tuned for episode four.